So welcome to module 9 and we'll be talking about memory management. When we look at the execution of an instruction, we actually see that there are 5 stages in the execution of an instruction. One is to fetch the instruction, increment the program counter. The second step is to decode the instruction. The third step would is to fetch the relevant data for that instruction. Fourth is to execute the instruction, fifth is to throw back the result. Out of these three stages, fetching the instruction according to von Neumann model of computation, the program that is to be executed should reside in the memory. So, I have to fetch the instruction from memory. I have to also fetch the relevant data from, I might also need to fetch the relevant data from memory and then I might also want to store the data back into memory. So, there are three important uh, steps in this five steps which basically looks at memory or which needs memory. So, managing memory is a very, very important aspect of uh, you know operating systems uh, overall management uh, portfolio and from a security point of view also memory management is extremely crucial. So, in the information security 2 course, we had actually seen about inter and intra process protection against process A trying to access process B's data or code or stack and vice versa. And even within process A, process A trying to exceed the limit of memory allocated to it. So, there were a lot of architectural support that was available which can basically detect any type of malfunctioning of the process in terms specifically from the terms of uh, protecting the memory that is allocated to it and ensuring that it is used correctly. So, we had seen quite a bit of that in information security 2 course. Now, what there we had talked about what can an architecture do towards uh, protection of the memory that a process is basically allocated by the operating system. So, it was more from an architectural perspective security and protection can be enforced on memories allocated to processes. In this module, we will see the operating systems perspective. So, in the, this module 9 and module 10, which is memory management 1 and memory management 2, we will look at different functionalities of the operating system with respect to managing memory in terms of allocation of these memories to processes and retrieving it back. So, so that would be the subject content and as I mentioned earlier, uh, three of the six steps involved will basically uh, touch memory and so memory management is extremely crucial. Now, what does the programmer want? Since as per the von Neumann model, the program that is going to be executed should reside in memory and the CPU only talks to memory, they need programmer wants to write large programs, he wants it to be executed fast. And if there is a, he wants the program to be stored for multiple executions. So, three requirements from memory is that it should be large, it should be fast and it should also be non-volatile. That is when there is a power cut, the program that you have written should be again readable at a later point of time. Now, when we look at these three parameters, these are three orthogonal parameters. If I want very large memory, then it cannot be fast. If I want non-volatile memory, then it cannot be, uh, you know, it cannot be both fast and large. So, if I want a non-volatile memory, I could have it on fast, but it cannot be large or it can be large, but it cannot be fast. So, all these three parameters essentially are three orthogonal parameters trying to improve one will deteriorate the other two. And so, striking the balance and managing them is, is going to be the uh, biggest task of the operating system. So, to manage these three parameters, the entire system is built on what we call as a memory hierarchy. So, the CPU is a chip, inside the chip there is some amount of memory which is very fast, but it is not non-volatile, it is a volatile memory and it, it cannot be too large. It is a small, but fast, but volatile memory, right and this is, this is the cache cache or the registers that you have inside the chip. Now, after that 
there is a large memory, but it will be slower than what we had seen the cache and it will be volatile and that is the main memory. After this, there is a large memory which will be much slower, but non-volatile and that is the disk and tapes. So, there is a memory hierarchy, there is a non-volatile large slow memory which is the disk, there is a volatile little fa faster, but and little uh, less larger uh, memory which is the RAM and then there is a volatile very fast, but very small memory which is the cache and the registers. And uh, so, as we move away from the CPU, if you are within the CPU the same chip, then your size is going to be small and your, but your access is going to be fast. And as I start moving away from the CPU to the RAM then to the disk, then your size is going to become larger but your speed is going to reduce and of course, the volatility uh, is achieved with a disk storage. So, manager uh, part of the operating system has to handle this memory hierarchy uh, in the best way. So, this is the von Neumann stuff. Uh, the program must be brought from the disk into the memory and placed within a process for it to be run. So, the, when the program is brought into the disk from the disk into the memory, then it actually becomes a process as I had mentioned earlier process is a program in execution and so the program starts executing then it actually becomes a process. Now, the main memory and registers are the only storage which the CPU can access directly. So, the CPU cannot access the disk. Right? So, the register access can happen within one CPU clock or even less than that it is very fast. So, the main memory can actually take many cycles while the cache is actually sitting between these registers and the main memory. So, it takes a couple of cycles. Now, one of the important thing is that what so cache is a replica of the main memory. So, that should be both needs to be protected in the sense that when when the CPU wants access from main memory some copy of some of the relevant data and instructions would be inside the cache. So, the first the CPU will go and check the cache if it has the relevant data or the relevant instruction. If it is there, then it will access from the cache. Access means it can read or write into that cache. If it is not there, then only it goes to the main memory. So, there is always a possibility that the content of the main memory and the content of the cache are different. For example, let us say address 1000, 1000 in the main memory may store 50, but the same 1000 would have been fetched into the cache. So, and the CPU would try to write into 1000 and it would have made it say 48. Right? So, there is a difference between what is stored in the cache and what is stored in the equivalent uh, address in the main memory and this needs to be addressed. So, this is one correctness that we need to uh, ensure and this is actually called as cache coherency issue. And uh, so, other thing is that there are two processes in execution when uh, when process A is executed the corresponding caches of that are filled. When process B is executing it may be uh, allocated to some other memory locations. When it starts executing in the CPU process A cache need not be completely invalidated because process A will come back to execute at a later stage and and that whatever is there in the cache is necessary for it to go and execute there in a fast manner. So, when process B is executing process A's addresses would have been cached the content would have been cached and so process B should not be in a position to access those cache entries. So, these are all some of the issues that we need to keep in mind uh, when we want to ensure protection between two processes and that is also very important from an inf information security point of view. So, these are some of the background uh, things. Uh, so, I assume that all of you know what a cache is, what a main memory is and how cache works. These are all very basic things. Now, from that as a background, I am posing certain problems in the area of information security. The other important aspect, so when a process into existence, the operating system gives it some memory. So, the process needs some memory for storing its instruction, storing its data and also the stack. So, at least three 
chunks of memory are given by the operating system to a process that comes into execution. Now, when the process completes its execution, now the operating system has to reclaim this. So, essentially uh, it should reclaim the data and stack and the memory allocated so that it could be reused for some other process and this is also very, uh, very important aspect of memory management. And when I reclaim and allocate it to some other process, some data that is written by the old process should not be seen by the new process. So, should we go and completely null it? If, if every memory that is released, if it is going to be nulled and then given to some, then there can be some issues uh, in, in the sense that uh, there can be performance issues. And so, these are all some of the decisions the operating system needs to take from an information security perspective. So, there is a process executing, it releases the memory. Now, this memory is allocated to process B. Now, should I nullify this or just keep it off? So, these are some of the, if I nullify then there are some performance issues. If I do not nullify then there are some security issues. So, these are some of the balances that we need to strike. So, this is also some very important aspect of information security from the memory management perspective of operating systems. Now, this is how things work in a multi-programmed system. What is a multi-programmed system? More than one process are ready to execute at any point of time. Then for example, a mail server. So, there are many people who have logged in, many processes will be in execution. Suppose I say there is only one CPU, some amount of CPU time will be given by the operating system for user 1, his process will be pulled out and then user 2 will be given then user 3, then user 4. This is basically scheduling, a round robin scheduling essentially happens. So, there will be different programs that are basically trying to get executed at the same point of time. And for each of these programs, there will be some memory that is allocated. Right? The way operating system allocates this memory, there are multiple ways. So, one of the thing is this fixed memory partitions. For example, um, there could be say three input queues as you see on your left hand side. So, one of the queue will be allocated partition 4, another queue will be allocated partition 2, another queue will be allocated partition 1. So, this type of a, a partitioning even from an information security perspective, we could say that we could have different ways of reclaim policies. For partition 1, I say extremely secure programs can execute only in partition 1. So, so now you see that in partition 1, there are three programs that are allocated memory in partition 1. If at all they need memory, they should take it from partition 1. And whenever the memory is released, that will be completely nulled, right. So, that so extremely secure programs can be sitting in partition 1. Similarly, there could be something in partition 2, right. So, so partition 2 may be completely insecure programs, like meaning I do not want that, uh, that level of security. Now, partition 4 can be uh, you know again it can be either secured or se not secured. So, this is what we call as uh, multiple partition uh, based allocation of memory and a program can a process can be allocated to one of these queues and you can be allocated. The other way is to have a single input queue and you can allocate it to any of these partitions right. So, again the drawbacks between the what you see on the left of your screen and what you see on the right of your screen is that in the left hand side, if suppose there are no processes for partition 4, right, that part the entire memory of partition 4 will be remaining vacant, while there is a big queue for partition 1, then there will be not enough memory uh, to serve it. So, the essentially this the longer queue in partition 1, the waiting time for the process will increase, right. So, uh, and at the same time there will be so much memory in partition 4 that is vacant. But we cannot do this shifting there because we had not said this is fixed, uh, the queue to which you can go is fixed. On the right hand side, we see all the partitions are available for all the processes except some part which will be occupied by the operating system as you see on the bottom most part of the memory. Now, that time of uh, you know memory wastage will not happen, so, that, so every memory will be used. But at the same time, I could not have different reclaim policy or scheduling policies for the different partitions in the memory. So, these two are two different concepts. So, even in modern systems where we are trying to enforce security, there we could designate different uh, modules of the memory uh, as one as very trusted memory or process can only trusted process can access those memory and we can say an untrusted memory. We can 
create now we call it as partition we can also call it as zones so i could have different memory zones one zone is extremely protected on only certain process can do and the other zone can be extremely uh, free to use uh, in the information security two cores we had actually seen a memory can be allocated to one of the four privilege levels so i could have privilege 0 which is extremely trusted then privilege 1 privilege 2 privilege 3 and and the so i could have different privilege levels and i can also ensure that a privilege 3 process cannot touch privilege 0 etc so we had uh, used segmentation and and or paging to basically achieve this in the context of the x86 architecture this was demonstrated through labs in the uh, information security 2 course so once we do this type of allocation so there are different things that are very very important here the three important things are one is swapping another is fragmentation another is compaction so what is swapping so let us go back to the previous slide so let us take uh, partition one here uh, i have three processes that are pending here now let us say each process needs um, say one needs 50k another needs 75k right 50k is allotted now when 75k wants to execute there will not be enough memory because there is only totally 100k here so what we need to do is when the 75k process has to execute this 50k has to be moved into a swap space so that is what we call it as swapping so swapping is very very important right allocation first which process goes to which partition is one allocation after doing this allocation i may have to swap because there may not be enough memory available to execute so i can't say that process 2 will wait till process 1 should complete then only process 2 can come in that's also wrong because then the process 2 can eternally wait if process 1 takes long long time right so i need to do a sort of round robin scheduling here the process 2 also should start executing so when process 1 is executing it consumes 50k of memory now when process 1 is removed now process 2 starts executing that will require 75k of memory now what will happen for the 75k i have only 100k 50k is already occupied by process 1 so i have to remove process 1 i have to swap it and then bring it back so swapping is very very important here the third important one is allocation the second is swapping the third important thing is what we call as fragmentation so let us take so there is some say 100k of memory now process 1 comes it occupies uh, say 60k process 2 needs 20k it occupies process nee uh, 3 needs 10k it occupies that right now process 4 so this is 0 60 80 90 process 4 also needs 10 it also occupies this 10k so this is 100 okay now let us say that process 4 finishes process 4 finishes that means um, this goes off and process 2 also finishes this finish now what we need is what the total amount of memory now available is 30k right because process 2 and process 4 finished now there is a process 5 which is asking for 25k so i have 20k here left and there is 10k here left now there is a new process which is asking for 25k now this 20, i can't allocate this 25k process here because i don't have contiguous memory which is 25k right so what i need to do when i shift this 10k ground then i create 30k here on the top to which i can give you 25k i can give 25k to the process p five right now that means what has happened here when this two process two and process four left the system essentially it has created some holes or what we call as fragments and because of this fragmentation though i have 30k of memory and the new process only wants 25k of memory i am not in a position to give that 25k because i need to compact it and then only i can give so this notion of fragmentation and compaction is very very important from a memory management perspective so the three important things that we see here basically swapping fragmentation and compaction and what we did when we compacted essentially we collected we call this garbage collection right something that has got over so as we see in the previous slide this 10k and 20k which was occupied by process 2 and process 4 
process 2 completed, process 4 also completed. Now those are all useless things, so that is why we call it garbage. So we collected it as one chunk which is that 30k and then we started working on this. Different aspects of operating systems, um, so when I want to do memory management, I need to do allocation, I need to do swapping, I need to do fragmentation, uh, I should handle fragmentation through compaction and when we do this allocation, I might have multiple partitions, I might have and when I reclaim, there are issues related to security. All these things we have summarized in so far. So, to achieve this, already I talked about protection, protection between processes, protection across processes. For this, the operating system takes the help of the uh, uh, architecture. We have talked about that in the information security two course in a very big way. The other important thing is of course, what we call as virtual memory. Virtual memory is that to the user I give, uh, so suppose I am a 32 bit architecture, to the user we give a 4 GB address space. We tell the user you write a program that can be as large as 4 GB. But what we do is that we execute that 4 GB program, actually the operating system ensures that that 4 GB program can be executed on a machine which has just 2 GB of RAM. So the operating system gives the user a virtual memory of 4 GB but underlying it has only physical memory of 2 GB and so it executes that 4 GB program on the 2 GB system. So how does this happen? The architectural support for this was covered in information security 2 course. Now we will see some of the operating system perspective also from this. Okay. And of course the operating system should also support IO and the IO actually happens as memory mapped IO. So, if you look at any of the operating systems for say if I, ta if I take a USB device, there will be a set of memory locations uh, allocated to this USB device. So, anything that I write into the USB device or any uh, transaction that I do through the USB device can be done through controls pass through these memory locations. So, memory mapped IO, we call it as memory mapped IO. And the devices can also talk to the memory independent of the CPU and that is also called as direct memory access. So, so the operating system should ensure that direct memory access happens without any interference with the uh, CPU uh, in the sense that uh, if there is a memory allocated for direct memory access that should not be read or accessed by the CPU when the DMA actually happens and also uh, the, uh, the operating system should uh, give some set of locations for every device so that the CPU can talk to that device typically to control it and to see how these operations are happening on the IO devices by actually writing into those memory addresses. So for every device there is some memory uh, locations allocated, Th those are not really on the RAM but if, if the uh, CPU writes into those locations essentially that write will go to the device. So this is actually called as memory map IO. And uh, we have discussed some amount of this in the information security 2 course. So to sum up, the main memory is a large array of word or bytes and each word or byte has its own address and for a program to be executed, it must be mapped to absolute addresses and loaded into this memory. And the OS must keep track of which parts of the memory are currently being used and by whom and decide which processes are to be loaded. Uh, into memory when memory space become available and allocate and deallocate memory space as needed. Now coming to the virtual memory, we have covered all the architectural aspects in the previous course. Now there is something called demand paging or we can also call demand segmentation. So what is demand paging? We can uh, very quickly see here in this next slide, when a process is to be executed, so we let us call this as the logical address space and this is the physical address space. Now the pages are basically stored in the hard disk. Now as and when I need something to execute, I move from the hard disk into the main memory, one page, execute it, 
and after I do not need it I then swap it out back to the physical space or physical storage space. So, if I look at a 2 power 32 address space as we had seen in the previous course and if each page is 2 power 12 uh, bytes. So, I have 2 power 20 pages all the 2 power 20 pages if, if at all they are going to be there will be stored on the disk and as and when I require a page for execution I will fetch it from the disk into the main memory execute and after, after I do not need it I then swap out into the main memory into the disk. So, this is what we call as demand paging on demand whenever I need something I bring it from the disk execute and basically transfer it back into the disk. So, this is called demand paging. Um, so, the main uh, issue here is that if the OS reads the desired pages into the memory and restarts the process as though the page had always been in memory. So, that is the most important thing. So, every time when a process is executing whatever it needs to execute the, the next instruction to be executed the data needed by the next instruction should always be in the memory. So, as by von Neumann model my uh, memory will have the necessary data and instruction for execution. Once that is over or some other process wants to occupy memory we swap these pages back into the hard disk and again when this process comes back into execution we bring it back from the main memory. So, that from the process perspective it is something that it actually occupied this memory it went back to disk and came back, but it should restart from exactly where it left and that, that context is basically saved here. So, this is basically what we uh, call as demand paging. So, what happens how does demand paging essentially works? So, let me say that um, so we will just give you a very simple uh, example here. So, let me say that uh, uh, a particular program has say 5 pages this is the logical address space, but say we are only allocated say 2 pages in the main memory for it to execute. So, let me call it as 2 page frames in main memory. As I had explained a photo sits inside a photo frame similarly a page will sit into a page frame. So, the main memory will have page frames on which you can bring in any page and uh, throw it back. So, let us see um, how this is going to work. Now, when the program starts executing that is nothing is there in the main memory. So, it will now see whether it needs to execute something from page 1, but page 1 is not in the main memory. So, so immediately a page fault will be created. Once the page fault is created there is a page fault handler which will bring page 1 into main memory. Now, this entire page 1 will get executed now. So, now it will now the program wants to execute page 2. So, page 2 is brought into the main memory right. Now, the program wants page 3, but it has only 2 page frames right. So, which uh, which page to replace? So, there comes the concept of what we call as page replacement algorithms. So, I go and replace say page 3 page 1 I want to throw out. So, my page replacement algorithm says that let us remove page 1. So, I swap page 1. So, I write back page 1 back here and I bring page 3 here. Now, page 3 executes now I want page 4. Now, the operating system says now let us remove page 2. So, I swap back page 4 page page 2 and bring in page 4 and so on. So, as and when I require new pages I bring it from the logical uh, the, from the disk. So, this is disk uh, and uh, this is the main memory. So, I move from the disk into the uh, uh, main memory and then uh, you know write back into the disk. So, swap in and swap out from the disk to the main memory happens here and this swapping in and swapping out is done by the operating system. So, this is another very uh, important thing on what happens on a page fault. And what we are seeing is that there is a need for a page replacement algorithm and the page replacement is very very important which page to replace is deter uh, determines the actual performance of the program. If I have a very bad page, page replacement algorithm please note that the program can essentially uh, execute very slow. So, this is something that we need to 
look at. If I go and touch the paging aspect of the operating system, if I go and change something there, if I could manage to go and do something there, I could make the execution of all the programs very, very bad. I can slow down the execution. So, this can even be treated as a vulnerability. Uh, so, if somebody wants to attack your system and create problem for you in terms of service time, right? You, one can go and look at paging any of these paging, so memory allocation or replacement or swapping. If they go and touch something there, then uh, this can essentially result in your programs getting executed very slow. Let us look at some of these aspects of this. So, let us look at see there is a program uh, which has say 5 pages and this is how it is going to this is how it is going to access these pages. Right. So, that program is allocated 3 page frames. Right. So, first it, it, it looks for 2, 2 is not there, so this is a uh, page fault. So, it brings 2 inside. Second, it uh, looks for 3, it brings 3 inside. The third again, it is accessing 2, but 2 is already there in the memory, so there is no page fault. Then now it is asking for 1, so 1 is brought inside. Okay. So, this is a page fault. Now, it is trying to access 5 after some point it is trying to access 5. Now, which one to replace? Should I replace 2 or 3 or 1? I decide to replace 1. So, this is a page fault. Now, it is looking for 2. Now, there is no page fault. See, please note that if I had replaced 2 with 5 rather than 1 with 5, this would have resulted in a page fault. So, if I had replaced this 2 with 1, uh, uh, sorry, this replace with 5 and retain this 1, this would have caused a page fault. Now, since I did not do this, uh, since I did not do this, uh, I, I get a, I do not get a page fault here. Now, 4 comes in. So, which to replace? I am replacing it with 2. Uh, I am replacing 2. So, this is a page fault. Now, 5 comes in. Please note that if I had replaced 5, then this would have caused a page fault. So, 5 is not a page fault for me. 3 comes in, it is not a page fault. Now, again 2 comes in. So, I replace 4. Again 5 comes in, there is no page fault, there is 2. So, this basically has resulted in 5 page faults or 1, 2, 3, 4, sorry, 6 page faults. Every page fault essentially means writing one page and reading from another page from disk and disk is very, very slow. So, more the number of page faults, slower is my algorithm, slower is my execution time. So, I need to reduce the number of page faults and that is what basically uh, the page uh, replacement uh, algorithm does. Now, one of the uh, interesting algorithm is FIFO that is evict the old page. Uh, first in first out this we would have covered in uh, basic operating system courses so when i look at fifo first there is a page there is a page fault to start with that is 2 then 3 gives a page fault then there is no page fault here 1 gives another page fault now 5 comes in since 2 is the oldest page 2 gets replaced by 5 and that's a page fault again now, again 2 comes in out of 5, 3 and 1, 3 is the oldest to enter. So, that gets replaced. Now, 4 gives me a page fault. Now, 5 there is no page fault. Now, 5 is the oldest as of now. When 3 comes in, 5 gets replaced. 2 there is no page fault. Now, again when 5 comes in, 2 is the oldest fellow to enter. So, that gets out. Again 2 comes in. So, this is the oldest. So, what happened? 9 page faults happen. So, actually you could have executed with 6. We had a way of doing it with 6, but now I see 9. Right. So, FIFO is, is not so good for this particular program. The next one is what we call as LRU that is least recently used. So, what is least recently used? So, let us start this, let us very quickly go through this. 2 is here, 
3 is here again 2 is used then 1. So, so this is not a page fault, but these 3 are page faults 2, 3 and 1. Now, phi comes in out of 2, 3 and 1 the least recently used is 3 because 1 and 2 have been used much recently before 3. So, phi actually goes and replace 3. Now, 2 is still there fine, 4 is out of 2, 5 and 1, please note that at this point 2 and 5 are more recently used than 1, so 4, 4 replaces 1. Now, 5 is still there, now between 2, 5 and 4, 2 is least recently used, so when 3 comes in, 3 replaces 2. Then between 3, 5 and 4, please note that 2 is, uh, 4 is least recently used when 2 comes it is still there and then 3, 5, 2 works and 3, 5, 2 works. Okay, so, total number of this uh, is 8, 8 page faults. Oh, no, sorry, uh, it is uh, 7 page faults okay. because uh, this is not So, this is not a page fault. So, totally 7 page faults happen here. Okay. So, this is least recently used, but then when I want to uh, implement least recently used, uh, please note that uh, we need to have information about this usage. I need to consistently mention. So, when I say, so 5, 5 needs to occupy which one to replace between 2, 3 and 1, I should know that 3 has been least recently used. So, I need to maintain some information about the history of usage and that makes this LRU implementation much complex. That is why we say it is infeasible to do th this at pipeline speed, right? at very fast speed. So, out of the 3 algorithms we have seen so far, the first one took 6, second one took 9, third one took 7. Uh, so, 6 is the best, but please note that we do not have an algorithm for 6, we just did some optimal, 6 is optimal here, we can prove that, but we just took an arbitrary decision to replace something here, but it gave us 6. We did not tell you what the algorithm here is, actually we do not have an algorithm which can give 6, like FIFO and LRU gives you that 9 and 7. Okay. Now, one very important thing about cache replacement is uh, the Belladis anomaly. So, how can I reduce the number of page faults? Now it is 6. How can I re reduce it? If I increase the number of page frames, that is one intuitively that looks appealing. If I increase the number of page frames for a process, then the page fault, I give more memory, that means page fault will reduce. But that is not the case. Uh, there is a Belladis anomaly algorithm which you learn in basic operating system course which uh, basically tells you that as I keep increasing the page frame, my number of page fault can also increase rather than decreasing. So, I suggest that you look into basic operating systems uh, course lectures or books to understand what is Pelladis anomaly. Okay. So, we, with this we end the uh, module uh, 9 which is memory management 1 and what uh, the takeaway from this module is that memory management is crucial and if we go and look at uh, some of the uh, memory allocation, page allocation algorithms and if we could have an access into the swapping mechanism as a hacker, if I go and look at the hacking, uh, the swapping mechanism or allocation policies and if I can go and do something there, then we can really uh, go and bring the system down. Uh, very important uh, uh, thing is that uh, if you look at some of the uh, operation, operating systems, they have certain boot time variables, boot time variable are the variables that uh, are considered by the system when at the boot time. The boot time variable can uh, give permissions say to the database to basically uh, uh, you know um, allocate memories for itself, right? Okay, allocate shared memory for itself. So, suppose I have a database running on uh, in uh, an operating system. Now, the operating system can basically give permission to the database to allocate its own memory. 
suppose this system exists. So somebody, so what would happen is that you boot a system at some point of time and the system is actually running. Then uh, and it is maintained by an employee of a company and suddenly the company decides to throw him off. So the employee actually gets disgruntled. So what he needs to do is to go to that variable before just he is quitting. He knows that tomorrow they are going to send him off, today he may have access. He can go and make that boot time variable, say let us say that the boot time variable was 1. So that BV is 1 means database can take memory. So, and this is decided at boot time. After that, if you change this to 0, nothing will happen. So, the, the discredential employee can make this 0 on the day he is quitting and move off. No, you are not going to shut down the server, say, for next 5 or 6 months. Somewhere you go and do uh, yeah, the check. At that point, you, you, you go and reboot the server. On the day when you reboot, this BV will be 0. So, what would happen is, now the database cannot actually do its own memory allocation. So the database performance will come down. There is no way by which you will know that because uh, you and then after it actually you can take lot of time to find out that this boot variable is the reason for that. You may uh, now start going to the database vendor and he can tell you okay we need uh, buy more licenses, buy more core then they will make more business hardware will fellow will send tell you more hardware. Uh, database will sell you more license, so they will actually drain uh, more money and then finally you will realize that this boot variable has become 0. Now it would be a, a rather 7 to 8 months before which it has been actually made to 0, but you will only detect it 8 months later. So, so this is, these are some very interesting uh, security vulnerabilities that you need to be uh, aware of. So when the outer operating system is booted, if there is a control even to an admin to go and handle the swap or go and change the swap policies etc then it can basically lead to lot of vulnerabilities so that is one very important thing that we need to learn from the memory management point of view we'll continue on this in the memory management 2 module thank you